I'm going to dare you to do some things, and you're going to have to hold on. <laughs> really, 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 really. You know, I sometimes come up with ideas, and then later on, I think, wow, that was a really good idea. Because I see the depth of why I came up with that idea. Or not, I didn't come up with it. If it's a good idea, I didn't come up with it. It's a boom. I don't take credit for good stuff. Anyway, I understand now why I had to say dare to prosper. I, had to, I, I now get it because change is hard. Change is hard. How many of you have to have the same seat when you get here? Well, besides you, honey. <laughs> Thank God you take that seat. Because you know what? My air guitar's just not going to make it. <laughs> I mean, really. You know, uh, Ernest Holmes was credited as, as saying, change your thinking, change your life. Well, some people can't even change their seat. Really? Don't, don't want to change the way they've done things. Change the way they've thought. Change, I mean, change is difficult, and I just acknowledge that. There's a part of our psyche. It is human to want stability. But then we create it by not changing. Instead of knowing a deeper sense of stability that allows us to do a whole lot of things and we're still stable. But we're moving into that because that's why you're here. That's why you show up at places like this. So... <sighs> seeing yourself differently takes changing not only your thoughts, but your mindset set and your self-image. So prospering, even, and, and where, you may be prosperous, but you could be more prosperous. It just means thriving at a greater level. It just means having more freedom. It has more choice. You can have more freedom and you can have more choice. But it will mean taking your current self-image and letting it shift. And that, and I dare you to do it. So you're on the third Sunday, the third talk, the third, third of a series of the way that I work, the way I do things, the way that I teach, the way that I prompt, the way that I encourage, and the way that I try to show up every day. The first Sunday, the first lesson was about hope. Hope is in the heart. You let your hope speak. You let your, your hope speak because your hope will always take you into a greater sense of livingness, a greater sense of freedom, a greater sense of accomplishment, a greater sense of love, a greater sense of whatever you want to have a sense of. Hope will take you there. It's a, it's a, it is a holy word, hope. By the way, you can catch up by watching this on YouTube. Then the next thing was faith. You have to build your faith. Because some of us have faith. We have faith in God. If you're here, you have faith that there's something out there. Either that or somebody, you know, tricked you to coming by saying, hey, let's just stop here before brunch. You know what? Uh, which is, by the way, the way I found this place. Over 40 years ago, somebody said, well, let's have brunch. And right before then, I got this thing. I, let's, I'll just take you this place I like going to. <laughs> anyway, uh, it wasn't a date. He thought I needed help. <laughs> but I stayed. He went somewhere else, and I stayed, and I kept growing. And I'm really grateful. God bless his heart. Anyway. So you build your faith. You not only build your faith, you already have faith that there's something out there, but you build your faith that it is willingly active in your life. That it, 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 it is will is to support your expression of that life, of your life, of the life. It's, it's actively involved. We need to have faith in that. Otherwise, we pray and pray and hope it gets there or hope something's listening, or hope you are good enough to deserve it. No, change your faith, change your faith, change your faith. So that was last week. And today, I want to talk about setting intentions. And I looked up the, well, some of the definitions of intention. It's an aim, it's a goal, it's an intent. I mean, I thought that was an interesting, interesting 
definition of intention is intent. I mean, that's kind of like the definition of Kathy Ann is calf. <laughs> I like, really? <laughs> anyway, I just... <laughs> it's also purpose, and this is the one. This is the one I love, end. And intention is the end. Judge Thomas Troward wrote many books and talked about intention, and he said that intention is the end that you aim for, and, and aiming for that end, the means to that end is revealed. But a lot of people put their attention on the means because we're great problem solvers. So people will take their situation, work out the problem, and then intend th that their, their end is what they're going for. But trust me, this is what I know. This is what I know. I've lived. I, can, I can't say anything differently. God's idea of good is so much greater than mine. So much greater than mine. So why am I going to take a little teeny tiny, you know, slice of life when God says, here's a pie? You know, it's, it's huge. That's the, in, that's the intention I want to go for. So in our teaching, we let our heart reveal our hope, and set an intention around that hope because it's bigger than what you can figure out how to get to. I actually call that a high and holy intention. You can't possibly do it on yourself, do it on your own. So what would, what would you do if you listened to your hope? And it's going to call you to becoming a greater version of yourself. The intentions that I've set have called me into being a, a greater person than I was the year before and the year before and the year before and the year before and the year before. I had to grow into that intention and not, and to give up just doing what I thought I could figure out how to do. I'll give you an example of intention. It was 1992. Some of you weren't born. Just a few of you. But some of you were young, very young. In 1992, out of nowhere, my heart said, I want to be a world traveler. And like that, that's, I, like, really? I want to be a world traveler? I hadn't even thought about it. I traveled around Washington and Oregon, and that was the extent of my travel. Oh, and I'd gone to Disneyland once, and I thought I had gone to the Holy Land, and, and therefore, my life was complete. <laughs> I mean, do you laugh? But really, truly. And so, like, I've done it. And then I thought, well, how am I going to... But I, but I knew it was not coming from me because it's not the way that I would, had been thinking. So I set an intention to be a world traveler. And it's amazing how trip after trip after trip after trip after trip happened that fit into the budget I had that year. It was amazing that the, way, the means just unfolded for me to go places that had always been too exotic for me to even consider. And I always was able to afford it because somehow the trips fit what I was able to do. Year after year after year after year. Your heart, your hope, will always speak of expansion. Not necessarily moreness, moreness like as in having, but more as more expression. You'll go higher, you'll go deeper, you'll go broader. That's what hope does. And I love hope. Now, I'll give you some examples of how you might want to be, or I should say, use intention for this series. You might. You might intend to live debt-free. You might intend to have a really healthy opportunity fund. You might intend to buy a house. You might intend to sell the house. <laughs> it's kind of like, how many of you have ever prayed for something and then, oh, really? I prayed for a Corvette once. <sighs> I got the Corvette. The Corvette was paid for. I had no idea that Corvettes, and this was, this was in the 80s. Every tire was $600. Can you imagine six, $600 tires? And the, I mean, what would they be now? It's like, oh, I have my Corvette, but how do I get rid of this Corvette? 
please, God. <laughs> you might have an intention to be healthy. To have greater health. If you're healthy, how, what about greater health? Um, I have an intention. I have an intention to be strong, flexible, with vitality and strength. Because I have, I have an intention to, to be an old lady reiner. That's a horse competition, and I want to win. Now, I am winning in the rookie amateur, but I want to go up and win, like at the world show, which is going to take a lot of stamina, a lot of strength, a lot of balance, a lot of, a lot of things that I, I, I also intend to have in my health as I intend to do this other thing and see how things go. Also, I learned a lot about intention, by the way. You should just rub up against, well, probably that's not correct <laughs> terminology, but get in the proximity of Rose Loper, who had an intention to fly, who had an intention to be a general, who had an intention to, do, uh, to sail around the world. This woman is misintentionality. Rose, just stand up for a second. That I learned a lot about intentions through Rose Loper. Now, you've listened to your hope, you've listened to your highest hope, you've built your faith, and by the way, the faith isn't built and you're done. It's like, you know, it's not one and done. Faith is something that I work on every single day because something might happen tomorrow that I need a great faith. Somebody might call on me with a situation that I have no idea how it's going to work out. I need a great faith. I need it every day. So faith is always a constant building process. So you have your hope, you're building your faith, you set your intention. Write down your intentions and keep them available for review. I, if I go on a trip, I have intentions. If I do a class, I have intentions. If I do a retreat, I have intentions. I write them down, they're in my journal, I view them all the time while I'm doing this thing, and then at the end I go back and go, ooh, yep, yep. Yep, 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 yep. They're not goals. It's not like I will do. An intention is this will happen. See the difference? I am this. I am doing this. It's not like I will, I will. There are some good goals, but that's not an intention. A goal is not an intention. A goal, it might be a step, step towards an intention, but it's not an intention. An intention is this happened. Then, <laughs> I stay away from the habit, and this is a habit, of making happen. I give up the belief that if it is to be, it's up to me. You know, I fell for that. But I can only do so much. And then my hope is beyond what I can do, so what am I going to do? Give it up because I can't make it happen? No, a high and holy intention will call you beyond what you can do. So we give up the habit of I have to make this happen. It's a habit. It's just a way of thinking. And we start cultivating the habit of making it welcome. And you might ask, how do you make it welcome? Well, this is where the dare comes in. I'm going to dare you to do some things. I'm going to dare you. Ready? Take notes. Because I'm daring you to do all of it. Now, one of these might seem really simple or something that you can do. Yes, do that. But that's just so you can get started on what, you're, what the rest of the stuff you're going to do. I dare you to do these things. Number one, I dare you to give up control and micromanaging. I <laughs> now, here's the, fu here's the fun thing. We can have this great meme and put it on social, me uh, social media. I give up micromanaging the universe. And everybody go, yeah, and you get a lot of likes, and people share it back and forth. Well, how do you do that? Have you noticed that some of those memes, you read them and you go, yeah, how do you do that? I'm going to tell you how to do it. 
How you do it is you make a covenant with the universe to do its job while you do your job. And you're wondering, what's the universe's job? The universe's job is to make it happen. Your job is to get out of the way. And a covenant is a binding contract. A binding contract. So for those of you that have studied Emma Curtis Hopkins, chapter 4, you know that the contracts go like something like this. I covenant with the Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. You can call it anything. The God of my understanding, Ralph. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really care what you call it. Krishna, Jehovah, uh, Spirit, it doesn't matter. I covenant with the God of my understanding and what I like to call it. For, and then you name the intention. I will do nothing to create that intention. Your part of the covenant is, I will do nothing to create this. I get out of the way. For it is the job of, the, of God or the Holy Spirit or whatever. It is God's job to bring this about. It is the providence of, of the Holy Spirit to bring this about. It's God's responsibility to bring this about. It's God's responsibility to fulfill that intention because if it is the reflection of what I had in my heart, it was put there by spirit, and God will fulfill itself by making that thing visible, take form, become a reality, so that the invisible becomes real. It's spirit's job to make it real. It's spirit's job to make it tangible to you. <laughs> Same result I had at first service. <laughs> this is the, when, in, teaching, in, in teaching Emma's class, the Emma, the Emma Curtis Hopkins class, this is the hardest chapter. You mean I do nothing? You do nothing to. It doesn't mean you don't do anything. It's not like sit on the couch with Cheetos. <laughs> watching Game of Thrones, waiting for God to do something. That's not what I said. I do things, but I don't do things to make it happen. Does that make sense? I do things because I am inspired day, day by day to do things. I take some vitamins. I take some herbs. I'm inspired to do that. But I don't do it because that will make me healthier. I do that because that's what I want to do. I hate exercise, but it is really hard to ride a horse full speed ahead for two hours. It's just like... <laughs> but I, so Spirit gave me an avenue through which I can exercise, and I love it, and I'm grateful for it. Does this make sense? So I don't do anything to make it happen. I'm doing it to make it welcome. I have to be, I have to be on the playing field. But God's the coach telling me where to go. <sighs> that was a football analogy. <laughs> Write that down in the calendar, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> anyway, so... <sighs> Um, some of you know I've had more than one <laughs> marriage. <laughs> and multiple opportunities in between. Anyway, I finally realized I didn't know how to love and be loved. It's, it took a while. There was, there was a love chip missing. Uh, partnership chip missing. So I use this covenant. I covenant with the Holy Spirit to love and be loved. I will, nothing, I will do nothing to make myself lovable, for that is the irresistible action of the Holy Spirit through me. And I quit trying to be nicer, do the right thing, look the right way, uh, I, I could go on and on and on about things that are way too personal, but I gave up all of that. And I met someone who said, you couldn't even get me to leave you. I'm here for you. 
Does that make sense? That's the action, the irresistible action of the Holy Spirit working through me to finally attract that which I had been trying to make happen for a long time. These covenants are powerful. Next, I dare you to love and appreciate those who already have or are living your intention. I dare you to love and appreciate them. So if you know somebody, if you have a neighbor, if you have a friend that is making a whole lot of money and it looks way too easy, that they finally bought the car you wish you had, that they finally bought the house you wish that you had, that they finally are going on vacations more than once every decade and you really wish you could do the same, love them, bless them. That's powerful. And most of the time, I'm using money here or what people have because most of the time, we are envious of what other people have. Nobody is saying, wow, she's way too healthy. Do they? I, how how'd she get to be so healthy? I wonder if it's legal. <laughs> See what I'm saying? We don't we don't say, man, they're they are way too loving. I mean, I can't understand how they can be so loving. Why do they have a right to be so loving? But we can downplay people who we think have more and maybe they are taking some of ours or some of somebody's. See, if you criticize those people with money, then you are going to keep yourself from having money because you've already criticized them and you don't want to be like them in your subconscious mind. You've already said, no, I, I don't want, those are bad people and I want to be a good person. So give it up. And I'll share with you a little clue. Envy is the universe telling you it's time to accept more good. Not their good. You're good. That's why you have envy. I want to be like that. I want to be like that. In fact, I think maybe the reason I got the idea of being a world traveler is that there was a couple, Trudy and Dennis, when I first got to this center, and they, they invited me and my then husband um, <laughs> to dinner. And they had, they had things on the wall that were from all their travels. Like, that's how they decorated their house. A picture from this place. An uh, artifact from that. And I was like, oh, and now I just got it. That's why I decided to be a world traveler. That's why you're going to be a world traveler. Because I envied that. But instead of making them wrong, something said, well, it's yours now. Intend that now. Intend that now. I dare you to stop getting attention through awfulizing. Awfulizing. How many of you have little pity parties? Just the two of you that... Uh, we've only got... The, this is the holy side. There's only a few of you on this side. But does, it feels good, right? Does it feel good? Yes. It really feels great. And it's so unproductive. <laughs> it's so unproductive. And have you noticed that sometimes when you're awfulizing with people, they got a more awful than you, and then you got an awful over them, and then it gets to be a spiral thing. Well, you have no idea the pain I go through. <laughs> So I'll tell you a story of a, a former member of our center. She and a group of uh, women came about the same time and got really close together. They've used these principles. They've gone off and done amazing things. Her name was Maureen Manley, in case you want to look her up on, the, on Facebook. And she doesn't mind me telling this story. In fact, she's probably grateful. When she, Ma Maureen first showed up on the Sandpoint Way location, I, do you, I don't know if you remember her rose, but she was walking with a cane and she was uh, hanging on to her fiancé's arm and she was partially blind, could, not seeing really well, could hardly walk. And what was the real tragedy is that <laughs> she'd been on the Olympic cycling team and she got, on, he, uh, qu what do they call it, quick onset of MS. Instead of it being gradual, she just poof. 
But she took all the classes and she started believing what I was teaching and what we were teaching. And she started believing that her mind could affect her body and she started doing things. And she kept getting better and better. And you know what, she, she would tell you this, the thing that helped her get better and better is she started paying attention to what was working in her body instead of following what wasn't working and then expecting something else to not work. Because what she noticed when she went to the MS Society of Washington is that she would be in these small groups and somebody would say, I have this symptom, and then someone else would say, yeah, well, this is going to happen next. And then this will happen next, and then this will happen next. And she was around us enough to know that that was not productive. So she actually took our facilitator training, went back, and started circles in, at, at the MS, through the MS of uh, Society of Washington to have people start talking about what was working, what is good, what is the blessing, what is happening that they want to see. I'm not sure how that went because I haven't got the rest of that story, but I do know that she changed her life, and guess what? She's cycling again. And she will say there are days that are bad days, and she just stays in bed. But those days are, i got to get this right, Few and far between. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't, I couldn't remember the phrase, so <laughs> I had to have Jake help me last time. So she's not saying she doesn't have it. She's not saying she's totally cured. But by focusing on what is working, more of that happens. What you give your attention to increases. And I dare you to be the means to your end every single day by asking your heart, if your heart put a goal in your, in your mind and in your heart and in your psyche and you've intended it, then every day say, how do I go there today? Instead of putting together a whole plan, it's like, what do I do today to go there? What do I go there today? Back when I had never traveled, getting a passport was a really big deal. Like I had to go downtown, I had to get a birth certificate, but I did it because if I wanted to be a world traveler, it was kind of a necessity. That was making travel welcome. What do you need to do tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow to move towards your end, your intended end? The last thing I dare you to do is request and accept help. Because if you have a, an intention larger than yourself, you probably won't be able to do it all by yourself. Probably someone will offer you something. So my first trip out of the country came from a woman who was um, in our congregation. I, I knew her, I, you know, we talked. And she came up to me and she said, so would you like to go to Russia? This is in 1993. It had just opened up to Western travelers. And she was a travel agent. And she was going with a bunch of travel agents to see what the sites were that Russia was willing to have them see. And she could take a companion for, for airfare and two and a half weeks in Russia for $800. And I just happened to have $800. But her, I could have said no. I could have said, no, that's too good a gift. Give it to someone that's a better friend. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, be willing to accept help. Be willing to accept support. And then the last thing I'm gonna share this with you is this was so big, is I was talking to a friend last week and she had to move in a really short period of time. She got back from a trip. She was walking the Camino. She got back from, from Portugal and and her house had sold while she was gone, and she had one and a half weeks to totally clear out and move. I know. <laughs> and, and I said, well, how are you doing it? She said, well, I don't, well, just like yesterday, I had 11 friends over, and they were all packing stuff, and it's amazing how much we got done. And tomorrow I have three more people coming, and going, whoa, I was humbled. I'm not sure I could accept that much help. I, I know, yeah, it's like I would be up all night doing it all myself, maybe saying, hey, Tim, could you help? I mean, really, this is amazing 
what that woman did. It's like, ah, oh, whoa. How much help are you willing to accept to live the life you want to live? Let's pray. Mm. And I'm so grateful for this day. I'm so grateful for the music. I'm so grateful for this community. I'm so grateful for every person gathered here. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that Jake can play two instruments at once and sing. I'm grateful that Stephanie Ann has a voice that just puts you in a different place. You know, I, I, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to try her on the phone book someday. <laughs> oh, that you're off the hook. There are no phone books. <laughs> oh, I am grateful that the spirit and the love and the truth of God will always pull us into greater and greater expressions of what's possible. And then it will provide the possibilities to have that possibility become a reality. I'm grateful that nothing is put in our heart that is not accomplishable. I, I, I so trust truth. I so trust the universal plan for each and every expression of creation. And I'm so grateful that we get to be here and remember together, as Uncle Jack said. We're here to remember together. And so it is.